Okay, so we've wanted to get you to IMS for a while to talk one-to-one -one really about the huge phenomenon that you've created globally with Boiler Room. Um, I think everyone in this room would know what Boiler Room is. Um, I'd love to just go back a little bit and understand a little bit about how the concept came about, how you first ever conceived Boiler Room and what was the sort of thought process behind it? Um, in 2010, there were a bunch of us uh, running like an online a blog, uh, and really the, the main thing was we had an exciting music scene kind of bubbling up in London. Um, you know, a lot of our friends were running labels uh, or artists themselves or DJing, um, and we wanted to do something with that. We wanted to find a way of kind of uh, literally to create some kind of space or series or something where the music scene on our doorstep could exist, perhaps without without being spoilt, but could promote at the same time. And uh, our knee-jerk solution to that was to try and find a, quite literally a space um, where everyone could gather and this kind of community or scene could thrive. Um, we didn't want that to be in a club. We didn't want to do that in commercial radio. Uh, and at the time, where we had an office was a big empty uh, warehouse, and there was this old 1930s boiler room uh, right next door to our office. So our sort of immediate response was, why don't we move our turntable speakers um, into that room? And uh, we'd start having a sort of weekly hangout where we'd invite different DJs, musicians into that room to come play music without any sort of fixed agenda, no rules. Um, they could do whatever they wanted. And, and originally, we were just going to make a mixtape. Um, and for us, that was because, A, we had the space. B, we were looking for somewhere where our scene could actually hang out and do what they wanted. Um, but also because we were trying to think about like what content we actually cared about online. And for us at the time, uh, exclusive audio recordings, mixtapes were the one thing that really stood out in sort of music journalism. Um, but anyway, so we set, it, we set it up there and at the very last minute decided to tape a webcam to the wall and plug that into our laptop and stream it. And that actually became the kind of immediate direction. The next morning we woke up and what was exciting was that although there were four people in the room and it was probably fairly standard, it's like being in a bedroom. Um, we had a couple hundred people watching online and that turned into the kind of priority. So we kind of stumbled acro across it as a sort of out of necessity in trying to create a space where our friends could do what they wanted without um, the sort of normal commercial restraints. But your, your unique thing has been the, the camera facing the DJ with the crowd behind them. Who came up with that concept? Was that in the first boiler room? Was that the idea right from the beginning? Uh, I mean, that was completely incidental. We just, that was, we literally gaffer taped a webcam to the nearest wall uh, to the DJ, and then that became a kind of signature thing. I guess we definitely, you know, like any bedroom DJ plays against the wall, and um, that's kind of how we were thinking about it. We wanted it to be a place where you weren't, you know, as a DJ, you didn't have to make a crowd dance, and people weren't buying tickets to get in there, so you didn't sort of have to satisfy ticket buyers, and there were no you know, rules and regulations on swearing, people could smoke, have a drink, do what they wanted. Um, the camera angle was kind of incidental, but certainly uh, there was no crowd in the room, so it just sort of made sense. Plus the wall was right there and we had no bracket, so. Who was, who were the first, who was the first lineup? What was the first lineup? Um, the first people, so originally we were gonna have a different uh, artist every single week, and I asked um, Tristan, who now, who still runs a host, who still hosts uh, Boiler Room, uh, and Femi, who runs NTS Radio, who were two friends or people I knew of, and they came down and played music, and we had such a good time. It was literally us, me, Femi, Tristan, uh, a guy called Ollie was on the chat room, uh, and we called it like Office Jam or something stupid. Um, and then the next day, we all got on really well and just said, why don't we just program it each week? So. Within three weeks, we had Jamie XX, Mount Kemby, Theo Parish, a bunch of really amazing local musicians. And what were, the, what were the sort of key moments? If you look at the sort of trajectory of how Boiler Room began with 200 viewers to where you're at now, how, what were the sort of key triggers that really, at certain points, took you to next levels? What was the moment where it really kind of took up a level? I think it sort of it happened in stages. So, sort of 2010, uh, you know, we were still running off this blog. We didn't have a logo or a Facebook page or a Twitter or anything. Um, we did this every single Tuesday for three or four hours in the evening. Um, the first four weeks was pretty much like a, a clique of our friends, and we just invite people down, and that's kind of what we thought of it as. I guess the next stage from that is we started getting artists writing to us who'd seen this thing. Uh, they kind of, you know, they were referring it to as referring to it as sort of UK pirate radio evolved. So we started actually having artists far outside of our circle who wanted to take part. And that, of course, shifted the way we thought about it. It wasn't just 
a bedroom that us and our friends could play in. It obviously appealed to people far beyond just our immediate circle. I think the next stage was a few months later, we started getting press. Um, and that was a big thing because, you know, we ran this blog and it, for us, we saw press as sort of almost like comp competition or people who wouldn't normally support us. Um, and they, again, they would sort of label it from afar. They'd give us a bit of perspective by saying from America, this is a way of tapping into a UK music scene. Um, so we started to think about ourselves as this kind of keyhole into a remote music scene um, and, you know, allowing people around Europe or wherever to connect with the UK music scene. Um, and that, again, sort of changed the way we thought about it a bit. And then the next step, we was like, after a year of doing this, 52 weeks, we'd done this show in February 2011. You know, it was fantastic and exciting. We had so many amazing artists and we'd gone from 200 to 10,000 to 100,000. Uh, most, you know, tuning into these different shows, we still didn't have a website. So February 2011, um, we actually, we spoke with Red Bull who came down to a show, we did a sort of seed uh, sponsorship with them and that allowed us to sort of finally take it seriously, build a website, uh, employ one person, quit our day jobs. Um, but I think at that point, you know, we sat down and, we, you know, thought quite clearly about what it was and what we wanted to be in the future and the big question was like, what do you do next? And you know, do you, have, do you start working with huge musicians? And at that point, we had a sort of fairly, like, serious think about what we want to be. Um, but up until then, you know, it just, the sort of change was going from something we created for ourselves to that resonating with artists and music fans around the world um, to setting up a website and a Facebook and a Twitter and a sort of strategy moving forward. You're, um, you've got a very, I'd say, quite fierce um, musical uh, curation uh, approach and level and I think it's one of your successes and you, you've given a platform to a, a world of music that maybe wasn't getting quite the same level of promotion. We all thought the audiences were there but they weren't all living in one place. Tell us, tell us a bit about where, the, where does the line get drawn about who is cool for Boiler Room and who doesn't quite fit? So I think in that, the big point, the big, the big, big realization for us in February was that, you know, we'd had all the success uh, and, and, you know, people talking about us and lots of press and all that. Um, but when we tried to break down what we actually were and why our numbers had, you know, like when we started a Facebook, we had 50,000 fans within two weeks and I'd run a blog for three years and we had 30,000 fans. And so we were trying to put our finger on why this crazy growth had happened because it certainly wasn't just our friends. It wasn't like a cool thing in East London, whatever. Um, and I think the big point was we looked at what we'd done, which has essentially done 52 broadcasts uh, over those 52 weeks with very small emerging new musicians. Um, we'd never had, you know, the biggest stars we had were like a Jamie XX or a Theo Parrish, who were even then were sort of, you know, Theo's a legend, but, you know, not in the commercial realm, and Jamie was just up and coming. And I think what that said to us was actually there's a sort of, you know, the kind of the new music market of the MTV era, that was this sort of one huge mass, um, had now, you know, had now separated and divided up into these micro communities and scenes. And that's what we'd originally set up to serve as we were one of many thousands of scenes around the world. And each show we did, did sort of addressed an individual scene's interest, however niche and alternative or small those might be. So I think when, when it came to February and what we do in the future, we, we kind of decided at that point that actually the future of Boiler Room was not you know, going and broadcasting uh, Calvin Harris or a huge dance acts or whatever. It was actually our thing is serving a very underserved market, which is thousands of tiny micro communities and scenes, all with their own individual tastes and interests and all scattered all over the internet. Um, and there were two key things we thought about. It was one, like, yeah, we'd, we'd taped a webcam to a wall and that, you know, that was a sort of interesting aesthetic. But more importantly, it was so cheap that it allowed us to produce you know, two, three, four hours of exclusive content um, at, at a tiny cost. And the important thing about that is that tiny cost allowed us to work with all these um, emerging artists who perhaps otherwise, with other media platforms or radio stations or TV, would be deemed commercially unviable and they wouldn't be featured in the first place. So our kind of point of difference was that we'd, we'd established a sort of production routine that allowed us to cover exactly who we wanted. Um, the second thing was that, you know, uh, so we'd, we'd established a routine that allowed us to speak to these very individual tastes and to do that kind of at scale every single week. Um, and that was a very rare thing now. Most of the time now you've got kind of uh, big existing media who struggle to kind of speak to all these individual interests because they have a sort of a, a one broadcast hits all model uh, if you're a big TV network or whatever. Um, so it was the production routine. The second part of it was... Um, 
was looking at sort of, you know, at that point I may alone, you know, like when we went to Berlin actually, which was our first expansion halfway through 2011, um, we went there with the same ethos, let's go and explore the local Berlin music scene. Um, and we expect to kind of pick up new users and fans in Berlin and of course bring in a whole lot of new artists that we hadn't worked with before. What we did when we went there, you know, we spent a few hundred quid on the show, uh, we got four, we had a fantastic event, we had four hours of uh, music come out of it, but what we realized that there was this huge global swell in our audience. We suddenly had thousands of people who were interested in Berlin's music scene, um, but who were in sort of remote locations, whether that was South America or Asia, who could suddenly kind of connect with something that would have otherwise have been, you know, either too left field or an offline kind of unreachable music scene. Um, so what I'm kind of rambling on about is that I think our, what we feel our model is, is exploring individual small music scenes and interests. And so within that, um, you know, musically, we generally cover very new musicians and they're not, you know, they're on their way up and in no way do we, build our model around the kind of tentpole approach of six big artists a year. And I think that's really interesting for us because there's, you know, you look at a lot of the festival lineups and event lineups and it's all featuring the same cycle of headliner artists. And it's fantastic when we get to work with those kind of names, but our business, our core niche is kind of exploring and showcasing the underserved. And within that market, there are thousands of new musicians, a ton of quality. And our remit really is to be ideally kind of comprehensive in our coverage of new music and synonymous with whatever is interesting and good at the time. And by underground, we really just mean, um, you know, emerging music or a kind of sensibility. We don't actually mean it has to be. We, we like to think of ourselves as like a mainstream marketing opportunity for underground musicians and a place where underground musicians don't have to quality, uh, compromise on quality. With, with such a simple idea, and it's a genius simple idea, are you not surprised that the mainstream world hasn't tried to replicate it? I know we've got, I know certain magazines have taken up their, late, you know, their Friday live streams from a different angle, but conceptually, you're not surprised that the, the commercial world has tried to replicate it? Um, I mean, I think they have, you know, there's lots of live streaming. We, I think we had a couple of advantages. One, we were like first movers, and, and I think we used that sort of six to 12 month period to, in boring speak, to establish a kind of market position to make sure we did have um, a kind of cultural reputation, a big audience reputation. Um, and that sort of solidified it in one sense, but I also think, again, like our model is very different to what any commercial broadcaster can really afford. Sure, anyone can plug in a webcam, but I think that approach of, you know, we got to build an entire company from the ground up. Uh, so we were allowed, you know, it was fine for us to go, we don't need a seven day a week broadcast schedule like a radio would have. Uh, we don't need a studio, we can just go to people's bedrooms or wherever the opportunity is. Um, and that flexibility allowed us to build our whole sort of strategy and model around individual interests and scenes as opposed to like a, like a mainstream outlet can go into a stream once a week but ultimately they still have to they have one front cover or one mainstream radio show and they have to sort of use that moment to appeal to as many people as possible um so no i think like you know of course anyone can can live stream i think we actually have quite a kind of fundamental difference in the way we approach things behind the scenes i think it might seem like a very simple you know we've got a big audience because we've got a cheap aesthetic and we use that it's a bit more advanced than that, I think, in reality. I think we strategically choose to work with a thousand new artists a year. Um, I think commercial broadcasters, when they adopt it, go for six big artists in moments. And, and how have you financially managed to keep it going? You know, I mean, you've obviously worked with brands, which kind of works in some cases with underground artists and not in others. How have you, how have you kept the model going and, and managed to evolve this way? Um, I mean, we, we have no... Uh, We've not taken a penny of investment uh, to date, and we definitely didn't have any when we started it. Um, obviously, at the beginning, we had a great opportunity, had a free space. Um, when we did that deal in, in, with Red Bull after a year, that sort of sprung us into doing kind of very few, but, but sort of strong partnerships with different brands. Um, and we've really leveraged the kind of very unique access we have to new musicians and the fans that follow new music, who we believe are the most engaged, loyal, obsessive fans in the world. And we don't believe you, you can sort of access those fans by doing six front covers or headline appearances a year. Um, so I guess we, we kind of maintain a, a position on, on which brands we'll work with. We tend to work with people year on year, but brand sponsorship um, with a few key partners who repeat year on year is what we've done so far. Um, how, how important is the YouTube relationship? Was that a real game changer as well for you in terms of the support that they've given you? 
Yeah, YouTube was a fantastic. Um, we met a guy called James Cater and Patrick Walker um, in 2012 or 2011. Spoke to them for ages. And for us, it was like a uh, fantastic partnership for two reasons. One was that we, you know, we had no way of funding, um, you know, getting licenses and doing clearances and so on. And at the time when we went onto YouTube, um, we kind of fell under a lot of their publishing agreements. And uh, that made a lot of sense for us. And two was it's a huge distribution opportunity. We knew that sort of internally we were actually starting to work with artists that had a kind of SEO interest. People were just looking them up on YouTube and we wanted our content to be available on there. So it's been fantastic. In the future, we're sort of migrating onto a few different platforms on our own. But yeah, YouTube is an incredible way if you're on a shoestring and looking to get your name out there. Um, and I think we had quite a kind of uh, a YouTube-friendly model. We produce a lot of content. Um, yeah. And you've recently been working in Chile and Tel Aviv and Mexico. What's the, what's the sort of global rollout plan for, for Boiler Room? It's much the same. I mean, you know, we're, we're limited because obviously we fund the whole thing. Um, but... But, it, but again, our sort of mission in the short term is to be as comprehensive as possible. We focus heavily on Berlin and UK and some North America. Um, but we're launching in Japan next month, uh, Poland this month, uh, Mexico in two months fully. We've already done lots of shows in Latin America. Um, but really it's that anywhere there's an engaged and interested and passionate music scene we want to be at, um, either to cover local music and export it to the world, um, or to make sure that we're speaking in a way that's sort of locally relevant about our global coverage. Um, but we believe heavily in, you know, our future lies in the ability to map out the world's most powerful music scenes and make them accessible to anyone all around the world. And actually we think music discovery is, is not about choosing a list of genres you're interested in. It's, it's ideally about going onto a platform like Boiler Room who one day have actually mapped out there's a UK garage scene, there's a West Coast LA beat scene, there's also a beat scene in St. Petersburg and Russia and so on. Um, and you go in because you're interested in Flying Lotus and you leave uh, knowing about Sven Vath um, because you sort of see the proximity and how those scenes connect. So anyway, like us going internationally is, um, is more often than not because we think there's something interesting going on in those local markets. Um, we've, got a, we've got a little video actually which I'd like to show. Um, Hopefully it's all queued up. It's just a w one minute overview of, of Boiler Room. Yeah, this is a 2013. Maybe for those who haven't seen it. Tell us, um, you must have some funny stories of stuff that's been going on in the background of the cameras because you've had a bit of criticism recently for people looking bored, people sort of standing around not dancing. I was involved in one with you in Ibiza where Grimes was absolutely globally, universally slated for her DJ set, um, which was quite awkward. Um, tell, us, tell us a bit about, about the sort of craziness that does or doesn't go on at certain events. Um, I mean, there's lots of silly things that happens at them. I saw someone propose to someone else at a boiler room, which is ridiculous. But, you know, there's, there's like, there's all kinds of fun that you, you know, more often not see on the camera. I think a lot of people focus in on what the crowd's doing and, and so on. I, I kind of hate that, but I know it's inevitable. I think, uh, I think we actually, you know, to your point, there is a lot of amazing stuff that happens behind the scenes. I guess the more positive and interesting stuff is, the conversations and, and, and the things artists say or do or perform when they're in that environment. Um, we try and capture it on camera, but we're so limited. And I think a, a key thing, a lot of people say, oh, why don't you have cameras on people dancing? Why don't you make it more of a TV show? And uh, we would love to. I think they need to remember that this is not a funded uh, operation. And actually, such a key part of our coverage is, is not stretching ourselves so thin that we have to start having the conversation that traditional broadcasters have or traditional media has, which is, can we put that artist on our front cover? No, because they won't sell enough copies. Yeah. That return on investment question for sort of a journalist is what's killed them. Journalists are, you know, and, and in media in general, they're a fantastic journalist with great ideas and fantastic media out there, the thing they're really held back by is the fact that they cannot, you know, you're sort of slave to ratings or to, to, to sort of guaranteeing viewers and so on. 
So I think like we definitely do want to do more to make our kind of shows more engaging, uh, but our number one priority is to cover those scenes in the first place, not to focus in on a dancer. For sure, over the next year, you'll see us zeroing in on sort of special projects and definitely get to see a bit more behind the scenes. But you know, we're a growing company and we're sort of doing what we can and trying not to overstretch ourselves too much. And how many of you in the company now? I totally just dodged giving you anything juicy. That's <laughs> okay. It's all on camera anyway, so we'll find it. Well, tell us about the skits, because you've had a few, uh, few hilarious kind of um, parodies of, of Boiler Room. What was your take on that? I mean, you know, I think, the, I think some of it's nonsense and uh, I don't know, whatever. So like, you see the things like Toilet Room or whatever, and I, I think it's... I think the, the positive side of it is that we, you know, we want to form very dedicated communities. I think where we feel we fall, fall short is we, we have a way of documenting individual music scenes, but we actually fail to let those scenes exist in their sort of isolation and with their individual tastes on our website or on the boilerroom.tv community. Um, and one of the things that we talk about a lot is that Boiler Room is used as a sort of umbrella by lots of people uh, informally uh, to represent their local scene or to get together and you know, watch Boiler Rooms together or to just talk about contemporary music together. Um, so when I see sort of trademark rip-offs or whatever, uh, I think the kind of the, 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 the positive side of that is maybe people are using us as a sort of moniker to, um, to represent a certain sound, which we believe is very young emerging new musicians but um but, you know there's the downside of it is that you know people would email us saying can you come and do something in uh, rio or wherever it is and we just can't be everywhere um but yeah i don't know i mean i, I don't have anything huge to say i don't like what those about things the, what about the ben clock being boiled video oh that was tell good us, tell us about that that was really good i mean that was just funny like that's just straight up amusing the toilet room thing's done you didn't do it right no, I mean, um, I like you know those people who rip our audio and identify every piece of hardware used in the show and label every single song, even the unreleased ones, by digging around the internet. Those are like the architects of underground music culture, and if anything, we want to involve them more. And I think if they're going to make a funny video of Ben Clock, so be it. I love that. I saw a video where he played it in a club. Um, I think that's great. I think some of the dumber stuff is uh, is whatever. It's just. I guess standard internet troll, or whatever. And how? Just tell us to give people a sense of perspective. How how big is the company now? How I mean, how many people are working with you? What's the sort of trajectory from here? I mean, like any new company, we have a lot of oh, part employed as well as full time. But we have uh, you know 18 desks in our London office, a production team of 15 people globally, um, and another 10 or 15 key people who sort of juggle other part-time jobs in music as well as working for us but you know we're reaching seven million people a month through our audio and video uh, and live streaming um we yeah it's it's become a pretty like it seems like a hell of a lot of work it's changed from being just me to a lot of people working on it pretty hard um but uh we still seem to get a kind of higher audience return than what we generally output and that i think is What's really exciting about it? And a few, I mean, a few comments have been that you know, there's almost too many of them now. Do you feel there's a danger of overplaying it and doing too many a week? How do you try and keep the control of that? I mean, back to that point I made of us preaching the idea of the importance of a scene, but failing to actually house that. I think I, I don't think there are too many shows. I think everyone sees everything right now. And when we were a small unit doing one show a week and kind of speaking to everyone's similar tastes, and then we went to Berlin and it wasn't vastly away from, you know, techno and house wasn't vastly away from what the UK were interested in. It was fine, but as you get bigger, um, you know, like a record store, uh, we're like a record store without any shelves, just a pile of records. And, and yes, I think it's a massive thing we need to improve on. We need to develop the ability for individual tastes to actually live on Boiler Room amongst the wealth of other scenes we're, we're exploring. Uh, but I don't think it's that our coverage, I think the sort of outside opinion is that we're doing too many shows. I think the reality is we, we're not presenting it like any we're still working on a blog that was built three years ago, and uh, that's something we're working heavily on now, and we've just got a good tech team, but um, I'd say they're more growing pains, and you look at any editorial or, or, or site putting out content online, and they've all successfully managed to, even by geography, go, if you're landing on the UK page, you see a sort of UK opinion. We don't even have that. It's like, <laughs> it's one site that houses like a Pinterest of recordings. Um, who's, the, who's the one DJ you've not been able to get that you've really wanted? to perform on Boiler Room? Uh, Jeff Mills, but we're, 
I mean, there's a few, there's a couple. Jeff Mills is, um, you know, one of those things. Is like the more the more he says no or we talk, the more we want it. But um, actually, we heard this week there's a show going right now with Mike Huckabee and I think Theo and a bunch of people were down there. And apparently, Jeff Mills is open to doing a wizard. Show. I don't know. Actually, I shouldn't say this on this, but hopefully, yeah. There's there's always a few. Yeah. What was his reason for saying no? I don't know. I think he's just. You know, I think we've we've become very known for like a bunch of people dancing behind a DJ, and the fact is, the first 12 months of our existence, we're in a room of five or ten people uh, with no one dancing. Um, and I think some artists are a bit more discreet than that; they don't want to be presented in that way. And one of the exciting things we've done this year is actually sort of put aside a pot of cash and like a uh, employed a proper video director to work with us on special projects so that we can do a show with a uh, hello. We can do a show with uh, a Jeff Mills or um, or a Radiohead or whoever it is, and actually pull through with some amazing production that's far outside of our kind of webcam on a wall aesthetic. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I think generally it just means you have to put in a bit of work. I don't think we should expect that just because we're boiler room, everyone should take part. I think it's actually it's nice for us to be a bit challenged and you know to have artists say they want to do something different to the normal. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to open up the uh, to the floor very briefly. A couple of questions for for Blaze here. There you go. One sec, just wait for the, for the mic and tell us where your name and where you're from. Uh, hi, my name is Stephen Taylor. Um, I'm from, well, England, near Winchester. Um, would you choose to grow any faster if you had equity funding that allowed you to keep your integrity of your, your vision? Um, I think the f what we would do if we were to spend money would be on that existence of verticals and the idea of an online scene. I think uh, we're kind of fine to keep covering more and more geographies, to expand to India, to go to more into South America, go to Japan and so on. I think the area of the business that we do need expertise and sort of financial, we need to sort of work things out on is, is the sort of tech and um, web development, app development side of things. So. I would, uh, I would push resource into building out our kind of grand vision for communities to live alongside each other on Boiler Room and to be sort of isolated from, you know, like if we're going to go into rap music, I don't want to piss off a lot of techno fans and, and, and vice versa. And I think that's the sort of, that's what we'd spend on. Um, we'd keep growing as fast as we, as we need to. Um, but content coverage is not the sort of, you know, we do that quite well. We definitely need to up our production game a bit. But the thing we fall short on is having a blog that doesn't even have a button for techno or Berlin or anything. Okay, want some good, help? Good question. Sorry? Do you want some help? Yeah, let's talk afterwards. Cool. <laughs> Deal done. Next question. Just got time for one more. Then Miles Leonard, who is stood at the back of the room, is going to come and run down the side it's, uh, with his keynote. Mike Louse from Digitally Imported. Um, I had a question uh, that was brought up in the previous panel uh, from the Association for Electronic Music and Royalties, and uh, wondering how you guys have handled uh, paying royalties uh, since you're based in many different countries now, uh, and how that has affected or has been affected by the growth of your audience. Uh, is this being live streamed? Is this being live streamed? It is not live streamed. <laughs> I right. mean, we, 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 we uh, initially we went on YouTube because uh, we had no solution for it. Um, as you know, clearing DJ sets is a, a difficult thing, and 60% of what we do is DJ sets at the moment. Um, the short answer is we do everything we can that's out there and that's an option at the moment, and we make sure that we're returning something valuable to artists and labels, which is promotion. So we've never had a single copyright strike to date. We've got over 2,500 hours of individual recordings uh, and the same in audio too. Um, so I guess we do everything we can in terms of deals, off-the-shelf deals and, and conversations that are available that we can have. Um, and beyond that, we just keep waiting for the societies to come up with a solution for DJ sets um, and make sure we're actually adding value to labels who ultimately are the ones who could you know, put the wind up us. Has anybody, anybody kind of crazy like Tiesto or Getter approach you to do a boiler room? Anybody that you just couldn't believe they even asked? Uh, I you have to answer I this I think it would be rude of me to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we've, had, we've definitely had some, we've had some major kind of EDM names that who aren't a fit for us. Um, and, we, you know, we've had some names we've put on that we probably shouldn't have, but, you, you know, two or any? three, Mac, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Well, look, I think uh, I think we all loved what you have created. You've contributed a huge amount to the global electronic scene, and for somebody like me who works with somebody like Richie, you know, Boiler Room has been an incredible platform for a lot of artists. And good luck with it for the for the future. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I appreciate it.